you know, in doing that, but then being able to find enough common ground, enough respect, enough love to reconnect, that builds the true friendship. That's why I go to war with you, because I'm going to war with you and I know what you're capable of, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I know the tools you have. We really have a friendship, not in the, like, a, not in the syrupy sweet way. We have a friendship because we know each other inside and out. We know the things that endear us to each other and we know the things that scare us about each other. Hmm. And we are willing to have conversations that may be cringeworthy and uncomfortable for the purposes of growing and challenging each other. And that is our sport. <laughs>
of content creators, black dating gurus and consultants, etc., who are purporting to teach black men and women how to find love, but are really only selling a specific form of anti-blackness and almost never seem to be partnered themselves, nor do they talk to other people who are partnered in their content. On the flip side, that type of content in media does exist elsewhere. There are plenty of black couple lifestyle creators. There's the Black Love Literal Channel where they are showing and engaging with actual black couples and relationships. But I don't know if they're really providing a more useful alternative really. While I do find it useful to model an idealistic image of what long-term black partnerships can be, they still often present a very idealized and probably highly sanitized image of what said partnership looks like. And in their own way, probably do as much harm as they do good by selling this false vision of what it's like to partner with a person long term. Not to mention the overwhelming cis heteronormativity present in that type of media where people from other lifestyles, sexuality, genders, etc. don't get to see themselves as a part of this black love concept. It's concerning to me, whether it be positive or negative, how we do not acknowledge that this image of black love that we have all been taught to aspire to and champion the most is not only false, but is based on a capitalist lie created explicitly for white Americans that was never really meant to include us anyway. So now I have an agenda and it's to support the death of black love as a branding aesthetic as we know it, and to provide a useful and productive discourse around relationship conflict with black people for free. So this video will not end in an invitation to join my mailing list or buy my consulting services. I'm not even gonna plug my Patreon. And all I ask is that you watch the video, like, share, and subscribe, and show some love for today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes and members from over 150 countries across the world, with everyone coming together to learn, teach, and inspire one another on a creative and personal journey. What Skillshare is basically is a learning streaming service that allows you to get new skills while finding inspiration on what to use those skills for. I had been hearing about Skillshare for years as an avid consumer of YouTube. And amazingly, Khadija and Bo, who I give so much credit for supercharging my career, did a video months ago where they offered free membership to the learning community. And that helped me rethink my entire recording setup to how to maximize my minimal access to equipment and expertise and turn my dining room into a mini set for me to record on. Skillshare can teach you a bit of everything from video editing, lighting and sound as it did for me to home coffee brewing, cooking, etc. Maybe you might want to look into the ultimate self-care playbook video series and use that as a way to detox yourself out of the doom scrolling and outrage posting that a lot of us participate in on a nightly basis. Whatever the goals or interests you have, there are classes and people available to give you a boost in pursuing those things. We're at the beginning of 2022, and I know if you're like me, then you set certain goals at the beginning of the year, and we're already one month down, so why not start February by investing in a new way to pursue those goals? New classes are added weekly, the entire platform is ad-free, and for non-English speakers, the classes have subtitles in English, Spanish, French, Portuguese, and German. But the real kicker is the difference between what I'm offering you here and what other folks are offering you in their self-help videos is that the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description for this get to sign up for one free month to see what the platform is all about. I'm charging you nothing but time and opportunity at this point. I really hope that those of you watching this take advantage of the free trial and use the platform to pursue something that serves you and adds value to your life. Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring the video. Now let's get back to the topic at hand. To help me dig into this conversation about love, I talked to numerous black couples in numerous situations and partnerships to ask them what they're doing and what's working for them so that it's not just my perspective that you leave with. But to enhance my perspective, I also thought it best to let you hear from my wife, we'll call her AJ Signifier, who I did a series of talks with over the course of making this video about subjects and ideas that came up as I was writing. You know, grew up with or knew some, at some point in time when I was younger and they get married, right? And they have like these big weddings, these big things. And then it's not funny, but like five months later, 18 months later, they're divorced. It's not funny. I don't know how I'm laughing. <laughs> but I'm like, how do y'all get out of these things so quickly? I'm learning to work on yourself, not from a selfish standpoint, but from a kind of learn yourself, learn um, um, so you can be a 
more loving to your spouse. When we think about there's so much pressure on couples, I ask, why is there pressure? Like, where is the pressure coming from? And I think a lot of it stems from when people look at you as goals or couple goals or whatever, I think people then put themselves on this pedestal to where they have to maintain this image of being perfect. And I think for us, what we've done, we've kind of broken the barrier between an online couple versus a real life couple. And what we try to present is, unfortunately, I hate to tell y'all, but like marriage is not easy. Um, I would say like not so much in terms of my blackness. Um, I don't feel like I had encountered a whole lot of um, discrimination or even, um, you know, that pressure that black people feel to be the best at everything. I'm not like, I have to win polyamory, damn it, in the name of my people. I've never felt, so when I was doing the blog about my polyamory, it wasn't, I didn't feel any pressure to do it to present for anybody else. And I've never felt like, oh, well, we need to represent what black and poly looks like for the world so y'all can see. So first let's tackle the juiciest morsel on the plate and engage with something that these black dating gurus often seem to have in common. So much so that you think they get along perfectly, which is this unyielding, fervent investment in white patriarchal constructs of gender as the framework for how we shape our relationships as black people. If there's one thing I'll never fully get, and I've said this numerous times at this point on this channel, it's how duplicitous black folks can be in our greed need to dismantle white supremacy, but our ringing endorsement of white patriarchal frameworks for how we form our partnerships. And it's not even like a wink and a nod to the idea that we know we're doing something that doesn't fully fit or serve us because we don't have much of a choice. And I get that, and I'll talk about that later. But no, black folks out here really completely align to white supremacist frameworks for how we define ourselves as men and women and how those definitions should dictate how we choose to partner with each other and how we raise our kids. And for the record, cause I know y'all are here, white folks, this framework isn't good for y'all either. And if you've done any study of white marriage dynamics throughout history, you know they've never followed these fucking rules either. It's really a mind fuck that drives me crazy the way it gets promoted and supported by black folks on social media. Literally, people are criticizing a woman who is a billionaire for having a baby with a man who is not on her level and becoming just another baby mama as if I recently watched HBO's Love Life Season 2 and it offers several interesting moments to speak on this topic area. Love Life stars William Harper Jackson and Jessica Williams as Marcus and Mia and looks at their long winding journey around, apart and back toward each other to what amounts to be a very normative manifestation of a long term partnership. They end up being a monogamous, heterosexual, idyllic family unit. But at least on the way there, they give us some things to chew on. One thing I love about the show is how it examines parts of black love that aren't as easy to sell or make outrage content over. Things that we often feel and know, but don't often vocalize around this concept of black love. For example, at one point in the show, our main character Marcus has a relationship with Ola, played by Ego Ndwodum which typifies the falsehood of black love as a commodity and the precarious nature of holding patriarchal values as a key to partnership. Marcus and Ola meet and Ola is faced with a professional crossroads, which jeopardizes her ability to be self-sufficient. Marcus steps in and steps up as a man to support her unthinkingly jumping at the opportunity to play the man's role in this relationship, despite not having really taken the time to know if that's what he really wants to do right now and with this woman. However, like many men who can provide hypergamy to women, he is awarded by what sociologist R.W. Connell calls the patriarchal dividend, being rewarded and celebrated by Ola for his willingness and ability to protect and provide. Oh, Marcus, my king. <laughs> Nothing seemed to work. How's my king doing? You know what I'm looking at right now? Black love. Supportive, strong, beautiful black love. Ola calls him king and Chris's their relationship as black love, ready for capitalistic consumption and sale to black people across the country. 
And for a second, it works for Marcus. But we as the viewer know that up until this point, Marcus is still recovering from various heartbreaks and is definitely in need of a lot of emotional growth to ever be successful in this type of partnership to find fulfillment in playing this role. Further, Ola is so busy celebrating Marcus's ability to perform patriarchal masculinity that she's missing some very obvious cues about how unfulfilled he is in this role. Marcus gets so alienated from this emotional connection to Ola that he becomes unable to perform kingly duties, if you understand what I'm saying. I used to think that I excited him, that I completed him, but he was lost. <laughs> so was his manhood. Having failed to fully uphold his obligation as a high value man, Ola reneges his patriarchal dividend and labels him a boy instead. You're not a king, you're a little ass boy. Melvin, look at this little ass boy snatching up a black queen, then treat her like a toy. He's not a king, he's a little ass boy. Can't tell the truth, can't experience any joy. Women, if you meet him, you better run. He'll waste your time. You ain't a king, you a little ass boy. This little ass boy, little ass boy, little ass boy, my little ass boy, my little ass drink for my little ass boy. A little glass vial, a little glass vial. And I love how low key Marcus doesn't even care. Like he's just so down. He don't even get mad. He's just like, maybe I am a boy. Oh well. So much is often said about supposed high value men. And it's always so incredibly shallow from our perspective as a great value man. And it feels dehumanizing. And the show depicts this. Ola does something that I've mentioned before when talking about Lawrence from Insecure. And trust me, we'll get to him. She projects the high value archetype upon Marcus because he's a decent looking brother with a good job. On one end, I empathize with Ola, who has a dream and is looking to her partner to help support her in pursuit of that dream. That is one of the best parts about being in a committed partnership. I understand the reasoning of why Marcus would unthinkingly jump in to play that man's role in their relationship. It feels good as a man, especially a black man, to have access to this imagery of patriarchy, even at a relatively lower level, when so many people think you're incapable of accessing it. It is something that I know weighs heavily on a lot of black men's minds. But it took me to step back and realize I, one, had to have a different approach, and two, I have to understand that this is, this is her ideology. So I can do what I do, but I have to dial it back just had to find ways that you know it, it it's equal that's one thing about Kayla Kayla is where she had equality is a thing uh regardless of what body part you got equality is a thing and you know I just try to make it as equal as possible while also not compromising my ideologies too and understand that just because this is maybe what the origin of it was doesn't mean that's how he treats me that's how he views me um, it's because he views me in a respectful way. It's because he loves me and because he sees me in this light that he wants to take out the trash and he wants to do this that in the fourth. And it's not just gender roles of, oh, I should be in the kitchen cooking while you work out there and do this, that in the fourth. So it's just been trying to, one, help him understand where I'm coming from and two, not take away from who he is. Like, I, 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 I hate what people that kind of like constantly keep elevating their life and you can't be a part of a crew and not elevating because you're saying other people elevating you not that make you feel awkward and I just didn't want to be a person that's like don't fit in when it comes down to being able to like take care of my family uh provide for my family so I just wanted more I have worked two jobs down there my whole life like I'm constantly I'm, I'm still kind of working two jobs it's something I have to do. Like, I just gotta, I always tell myself I gotta be better than my father. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I grew up in a household where, you know, my father was the provider. So I think if that is your, yeah, if that's your baseline, then, you know, anything other than that is, uh, is a failure, right? This was very profound for me. It has really helped our relationship. Um, when joining the company, and Brandy and I, we talked about this. <clears throat> what I what I've recently recognized was me striving and me wanting to really grow and scale the company. Um, I, of course, I want to make it a, a family business and build an empire, but a lot of that was me attempting to show my wife love. But my thought, pro the way my mind was working, 
was if I grow this company, if I scale this company, if I if, if we can keep looking at these spreadsheets and we're growing 150 percent year over year, this is how I'm showing my love to my wife. This is how I'm proving my worth. Um, you wanted me to be proud of you. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. And what I realized was I wasn't loving you in the way that you needed to be loved. At the same time, as I said, we can't just completely divorce ourselves and thus our romantic partnerships away from how economics and capitalism constrains us. And, the, and for black women, the stakes are really a lot higher than all of us often understand sometimes. Black women are the most likely of any racial group to marry a man who makes less than them, which makes sense considering the barriers put up against black men for them to access personal capital. And this conflict is really at the heart of so many issues these dating gurus speak on. At the end of the day, when it comes to the discourse around black men in these dating guru circles, it's about how black men cannot provide a normative image of patriarchal and hypergamous partnering. It's just that both of them come from different angles on what the solution to that is. And insecurity, anger, and frustration, and bitterness all swell in the responses to this issue of black people trying to run in a race that wasn't designed for us to win. The range of outcomes with black men and economic viability makes it so black women seeking to partner exclusively with black men have to figure out a lot and have to compete for, relatively speaking, a smaller amount of men who are accessing that high value man status. And it's really important that we empathize both with the black men struggling against the constraints of white supremacist patriarchy, as well as black women who are experiencing life both as women and as black people and facing their own unique form of oppression. But we don't empathize with each other because that doesn't get clicks and shares. We operate on these binaries where black men are either fuck boys or good men and black women are either submissive or have masculine energy. And it's no wonder that none of these people ever find love until they get off these fucking sites. Just, just, just saying. I think I'm more empathetic than I was. And I think because I, I, while we were together, I got my social work degree. And I think that helped me sort of figure out how to navigate challenging conversations. I have always been really ambitious. Um, and I'm sure you're familiar, but just being a black woman, I was always taught that that is, I had to, like if I, in order for me to get just a little bit of what I wanted, you know, mm -hmm. I had to do more. I had to be better. And so I've always been very ambitious and a high achiever. And in our relationship, I also, I always felt supported. I know that sounds corny, but like it, it just, it just kind of worked out try and understand things from her point of view. And like I said, I, I've not always been able to do that, but I've always tried. And I think that's what she's been responding to is uh, she could see me trying to figure things out, trying to understand things from her perspective. Yeah, there, there were just things that I just couldn't get. And there's still things I just can't get uh, right. because there are experiences that I am never going to have. Really cool about being poly in that you have partners who have been around how do I put this? Basically who have been around for enough years that they've seen you grow with other people and with them, which is one of the coolest things ever. And I don't, I don't, I feel like we don't talk about that enough in the polyamorous community. It's great that we can have conversations where it's like, oh, do you remember when I was dating so-and-so and I did this terrible thing? And it's like, oh yes, I do remember. Let me never do that terrible thing again. Thank you for calling me out and hearkening back to that time I did that. Or even like, hey, remember when you were doing this terrible thing and now you've stopped doing it? You can see the growth, but sometimes it's hard to see growth when you're your own individual. But when you have a partner who's been there for four or five, six, et cetera years, who's seen all of these things and can say, no, hey, I I actually see the growth. It might be weird for you to see because you're in your own body, your own head. It's very incremental incremental to you. But like I've been sitting on the outside and I can see it and I can help contextualize that for you. If you're making a choice about your own willingness to heal alongside someone or your willingness to heal alone, both of those have to be both of those have to be done in the context of self-compassion. And when you offer yourself compassion, then you're better able to stop evaluating people out of this lens of perfection. You're hoping for that unicorn of a black man, forgetting that he went through similar trauma spaces. He went through 
racism and classism and whatever other isms might impact a black man. And you have no compassion for that because you don't have compassion for yourself. And that's not to say to settle. I'm saying focus on all the areas where you're still hurting. Yeah. All the things that continue to trigger you. Likely because you haven't been offered compassion. It has not been mirrored to you. But if you don't establish a practice of self-compassion, it's going to be really tough to attract the type of man that can then, one, offer you the type of things that you're interested in receiving and do it in a compassionate way, not a manipulative way. And it, it takes a certain level of maturity and self-actualization to be like, hold up. Everybody is coming in and golden. Hold on. Let me spin this back pause i need some self-actualization time some alone time then i need to come back and readdress this dating thing with what have i been missing what 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 do i find attractive what don't i find attractive and then ask yourself why my filter wasn't up and so as i start clicking the drop down filter on different things and start looking at a woman as a whole human being with all of these different millions of attributes, right? So I started to see more and more who I wanted. Well, we got to a point like where we were just fighting all the time yeah. about nonsense. Okay. And now I was the one starting the fights because there was some a lot of displaced anger towards him that I didn't even realize was there. Being in therapy has helped me find ways to help um, have better conversations with him have um yeah. be able to communicate with him better as far as like things that i need or just kind of redirect behaviors that i was doing that weren't healthy it's definitely been a lot of sink or swim moments um especially this decade this decade is rough like i'd be looking back like yo you still in a relationship with your person or people and you got in a relationship from 2010 to 2020, shout out to you, because this this shit has been crazy. <laughs> um, and I think instead of like trauma bonding, what we've done is we've tried to like evolve together. But even when things go right, even when money and economic access to capital isn't an issue, we still see that things don't happen perfectly because we're trying to exist in a framework that doesn't fit us. So characters like Marcus or Insecure's Lawrence, these images of black men trying to manage roles as patriarch and their own sense of self find issues with finding fulfilling partnership apart from their high valued status. That said, I feel like, and maybe it's just from my standpoint, I haven't seen a lot of media created or centered around black women who embody that same paradox. I feel like I've noticed the same thing that even when there are black female characters on the screen that they still fit into certain boxes. And for those black women that seemingly have it all, they don't really problematize what that might feel and look like to women living that in real life. The pressure of having to exhibit black girl magic. The, the dream is, you know, you have your kids and you're able to love on them and cater to them, at least, you know, in their earliest time, right? Mm -hmm. And then your husband or your partner covers the provision, again, the, the money, mm -hmm. right? To make sure that you're comfortable in doing it all. And while we couldn't have lived the lifestyle we lived without both of us contributing, and I want to be very clear about that, um, there were times that because I wanted to still uh, meet and, and adhere to the stereotypes of what a good loving mother should look like. It was, uh, it was a struggle. It was something to process because everything else was telling me, girl, you doing too much and why? Mm. Really hard decision because I was offered another position for a very big company doing marketing and I turned it down. So uh, here I was on this trajectory, you know, in corporate America and my career is moving so fast, but I decided um, that 
I wanted to stay home with my children. I don't regret making that decision. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy being at home with my children, but at the same time, well, oh. what did you go to school for? What did you spend all that time for? What did you work so hard for? What's going to happen if he decides he's going to leave one day? All those things. It's, you get those questions, you get that pressure, and it's very intense. So it's like, it's like I see you typing and bouncing a baby on your arm and trying to do something. I'm like, yo, word. We were working through dropping those roles that she saw her mom and her grandmother step up and do all of the parenting, right? And so it's like, she, she has to step off that expectation. And I'm helping her step back off the expectation. Like, hey, I'm a full present father, loving, caring father. So I, every day, every day. So. There is something called good enough parenting for a reason. And I see now holding yourself to parenting perfectionism is a recipe for relationship turmoil and personal pain. Because when I, like I said, when I come up against these ideas of who I want to be as a mother and who I am as a mother, they are not going to be the same thing. Who I want to be as a mother, does not happen in the world I'm in, like in the context I'm in with us having no family around. Like, it's just, I'm, I need a village. We need a village <laughs> and we don't have that. And so that limited capacity is like, how much time do I want to give to, and how much time do I want to give to Ramon? How much time do I want to give to Candace? And then how much time do I want to give to my business and my job? Just to say, man, something's going to suffer when you got as many things and as many goals and as many high expectations as we do for every part of our lives something's going to suffer and you have to pick the thing that's going to suffer otherwise it will choose itself for you so to illustrate this going back to love life we see marcus eventually finally get with mia and she convinces him to stop working to pursue his dream as an author and up until this point mia has always made more money than marcus in exchange for this, he takes on the brunt of childcare, though partially it's an excuse to avoid the fear of failure as a creative. Eventually, Marcus is successful in writing his book and clearly comes up, and he offers a similar opportunity for Mia to leave her job, which seems ideal, right? However, one thing they don't really tackle is in that time frame, it doesn't really engage with the fact that Mia has to work and be black girl magic throughout her child's earliest years. That is something, again, I don't see a lot of discourse around. We have this neoliberal girl bossy image of the woman that works through childcare and maybe makes enough money to outsource her domestic labor that is missing from the home to someone else. And while that's fine if that's what works, it doesn't engage with what it feels like to be a mother who has to leave their child to be in an office, especially for black mothers for which motherhood historically has always been a complex and perilous reality to face. Are you fucking serious? Condola, stop acting like I'm a fucking stranger. I'm his father. And you're barely ever here. And you never check in, not about his swimming or food. And you don't even give me more than three hours notice when you're not coming. I have a job. And you moved away. Yeah, to take a job I already had before you blew my life up. Blew your life up? Yeah. You are not a fucking victim. Well, Lord. you made a decision without me, and now you're trying to use it as an excuse to keep him from me. What? How do you feel about Lawrence and Insecure? <laughs> I've been with AJ for 18 years now, literally around the time this video is coming out back in 2004 is when we met right in time for Valentine's Day. And she is a completely different woman today at 37 than the one I met when she was 19, as am I. I often call her AJ version three at this point. And at various points in our relationship, we've had to make the conscious decision to love and partner with the new version of the person that is emerging from the cocoon and ashes of the old one. I'm gonna make a haughty and maybe unfair assumption here, but I get the strong feeling that a lot of single consumers of dating guru content, and along with a lot of these terminally online commentators about relationships, don't have a lot of healthy experiences with dealing with partners over the long term. Because the way I see it, the folks coming through with these hot takes clearly have not been very successful in their love partnerships, which I'm sorry to hear that. I'm going to go to an easy example. Let's talk about Lawrence and Issa from Insecure. Despite the overall love for this show in the final season, which just aired a couple of months ago, 
it was a tad bit divisive and I get that. And there are a lot of reasons that I completely understand for people to feel like the show didn't quite stick the landing. But to me, an issue a lot of fans had was the final coupling of Issa and Lawrence together. I already made a video about how much I love Lawrence as a character at the end of season four, and those feelings have not changed, but we have to now engage with the final season. To summarize it though, Lawrence is a great character because he's flawed and because his flaws are relatable and in many ways for a black man on screen transgressive. Unlike typical male leads in romance stories, Lawrence's flaws aren't that he's unwilling to settle down or is aloof and has a womanizing habit. He doesn't have to be tamed, in fact, he kind of already is. He's indecisive and often passive. He's a person that thinks and contemplates and can be unsure of himself of when to act. When we meet Lawrence, he's in the middle of an early life crisis and a depression, and white patriarchy doesn't endorse us openly accepting black men in this state. I think this is one of the reasons why him and Issa ending up together at the end of the show is as divisive as it is for the fandom, because he's really the opposite of the typical male love interest lead. And this is not to ignore the faction of toxicity in some of his supporters, but again, you can watch the old video for that. For me, I love that Issa and Lawrence ended up together because it really offered a more useful message about love and black love that we often don't get in romance stories you recognize how much of this relationship wasn't about fulfilling a fantasy of black love, but it was a choice between them to partner with each other despite the shortcomings and flaws. So do you believe it'll work out? I'm okay with finding out. By the end of the show, Lawrence is very different, but he's not perfect, he's not fixed, and he still has some of the same flaws. And an extra kid by another woman. And Issa has grown a lot, but she's not perfect, and her growth isn't so much fixing her flaws, but accepting them as who she is. What sticks out to me in this final shot of them together, successfully co-parenting or whatever, in a beautiful home with the idealistic capitalist accoutrements of look how we got it we made it black love goals y'all but it's that conversation they had at the end of last season where they worked through some deep and ugly issues that they had with each other to figure out a way to come back together because they realized that they made each other happy of, of being comfortable and being secure in someone to be able to just share whatever is on your mind at any given time um I think that it, uh, for us, we go back and forth a lot with, with banter and debate, but it uh, again, it's just being able to not have to hold anything in. Getting there wasn't a, oh, we actively decided that we had to like walk into this new door. It was, he was trying to get in and I'm moving <laughs> him out the way. And like, we had to like really push ourselves through. I was trying to decide how I want to live my life um, and when I'm at a crossroads, how do I make those decisions? And I decided that I really wanted to make decisions based off of desire, faith, and wisdom. And when me and him later would be having um, conflicts or just points where decisions had to be made, I had already told myself that I wasn't gonna be making choices out of fear. And I wasn't going to be making choices out of emotional uh, laziness. Mm -hmm. I was going to be making choices um, out of faith and desire and wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> when I held myself accountable to that commitment that I made to me, mm -hmm. I feel like it made conflict between us have, um, resolve. Yeah. Easy. You think you're going to this a little bit too fast? I mean, what do you call fast? Um, you're gonna you're gonna go through life with that person and that's what you want to do you're gonna do it and we it's not like oh we're gonna get to know each other um in these two years that we talk and you know we're in a relationship with just boyfriend and girlfriend we get to know each other and all this and that then what happens when we get married that means that we, we stop we stop trying to get to know each other is, is that what that means um because i'm pretty sure there's still a lot of stuff you're finding out about your wife like it's and these are things that that's what keeps the relationship alive. I mean, it's a lot of things that keep it alive, but that's one of them. You know, you just keep learning over and, and it's that's the best part of it. You know? Conflict doesn't get enough attention in terms of how we think about love. Like we will see plenty of fights and romance stories and dramas, but we never get to see the conflict 
processed and resolved in a way that reflects the nature of what it's like to partner with another human with flaws and issues and traumas. But you know what movie I think does do a great job of revealing how hard and ugly this can be? A movie that I've loved but been scared to bring up for the last year because everybody else hated it? Malcolm and Marie, and I'm not alone. Your mind is not fucking based on you. It's an amalgamation of a whole different thing, a whole bunch of things. Who? People. What? People. It's because, you know, Malcolm Marie is not a it's beloved film, not very popular yeah. to the internet folks. But how did, how, how did I almost want to watch it, dude. <laughs> no, we don't abuse each other. No, we don't, you know, all those things, right? Yes. We banter like that. We, we go back and forth. We match wits. We psychoanalyze each other, even though we have no, we don't have the credentials. No credentials. Um, I have diagnosed him with a many of things and he has done the same. I stand by said diagnosis. <laughs> Aside from the abusive language and the unhinged eating of macaroni, my wife and I connected deeply to the profound conflict and ugliness put on display in this movie. A type of conflict that can only happen in a relationship that is imperfect and possibly even unhealthy. And I saw so many think pieces about how toxic this relationship was and how obviously the problem was Malcolm, which is easy to identify because, you know, it's always the brother's fault. I'll just say two things can be true at once. While these are all fair criticisms, it's shallow from my standpoint and it really misses the point of the film. Don't get me wrong. I wouldn't want to have these types of issues or these types of fights. However, I have. Because at the end of the day, Malcolm and Marie only give a glimpse into addressing that type of conflict on one night. And I was grateful to the film for putting on screen something that is rarely seen. The image of just how brutal long-term partnership can be. That only a person who has been with you for years, who's seen you at your lowest, who knows your deepest insecurities, can destroy you in the way a long-term partner can. Love is not safe. In fact, it's the opposite of that. You share bills, a house, a bed. That person is a liability. They are uniquely positioned to hurt you and you have to be okay with that. That is the reality of what all of you say you're looking for. You might be the first woman I've talked to where most of the black women that raised you were married. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and have been married, like not too many divorces. I don't, I don't think. I mean, so in my mind, that kind of made it real. You know, this is not for play. This is like if you are married to a person, then it's like a different level of acceptance, a different level of protection, a different level of everything, a different level of loyalty, because that commitment. And I, I just think that that's just what I saw. This is going my own area. Like I've been needing my own space. So like if she get on my nerves, she probably gonna be in a. She could probably be upstairs. I'm downstairs. Uh, me, like I go somewhere. I go sit at a bar or something. Uh, whatever. Like I just find a way to just like get away for a minute. What brings me back? Like once I leave, I start missing her. <laughs> so that's when I just be like. Back to normal. Monogamy, not that it has to be this way, but I think that a lot of standard monogamous is better, especially heteronormative relationships. Um, you don't have to confront as much conflict as soon or as often right away in your relationship. And you can kind of just float by in a prescriptive way. Your, your relationship ages much faster. And that is a, a make or break experience. Polyamory doesn't leave room for a lack of conflict resolution. It just, it, there isn't room because if you have envy, if you have jealousy, if you have any emotion that you would like normally have in uh, a relationship, it just, it gets multiplied because you have to address those things because they're going to see other people. So, and they're going to hang out with other people. You need to address these things and like have, as they call them, crunchy conversations. And I think while it's a fun word, um, like just, it's also good to not say bad or hard conversations, um, in my opinion, just because I think those words imply that talking and communicating through conflict isn't the thing to do. Because some people are not multifaceted. They, they, they're like a one-trick pony. 
And they feel like if, if it's not this way, if it's not the way that my uh, mother and father did it, if it's not the way that my grandparents did it, then it's not going to be successful. Not knowing that your grandparents slept in a separate bed for a reason. It's just like, yeah, they stayed together, but it wasn't like a great stay together. It was like, uh, yeah, it was we like tolerate. Cheaper, yeah, cheaper we, to keep yeah, we tolerate each other. And I never want to be in a marriage where, I to where we're t I'm tolerated. I want to still be, when we get 70, 80 years old, I still want to love her and I want her to love me just like we do now. To watch Malcolm and Marie run this exhausting, torturous marathon of conflict was cathartic for me and AJ because we've done that. We fought quietly, loudly, and dramatically for a few days as we worked through a serious conflict in our partnership. We don't argue much. We manage conflict around our differences. And for those things that we can't or won't change about each other, we make the conscious decision to partner in love through anyway, despite those flaws, because we value our partnership and family. But all of us who've been in love have looked like this, miserable, broken, tired. And this isn't black love goals, but this is a part of it. It's just a part no one wants to put out there because who would want to buy it? Who would post this? There are no pictures of me and AJ after a long, exhausting fight or disagreement at our lowest. It's only the family photos, the fun times, the highlight reel. But both of these moments, the ones you see and the ones you don't, are a part of our partnership and our love story. AJ said in a conversation that I didn't catch on film, that few of us have ever seen a couple walk through a valley together successfully. We only usually see the aftermath. We hear the Lemonade album or see the exclusive interview or read the divorce announcement. And we judge so harshly as if all three of those things aren't reasonable things to do when a partnership does become too much and does fail. We all want 90s Will and Jada, but we had a lot to say about Will and Jada sitting at the red tape. Literally, all the five senses are, are, or I mean, depends on where we are tasting and it's activated. Because I want to like that memory of where I am with like my favorite person is something that I want to like just hold on to, and it's important to me, uh, so that I can. Because we always we use also a phrase, "Remember when?" So it's you know we can share that moment together, and um, it it kind of. Like if we're having a rough day or something's hard, uh, I can go back to a sheep field or watching the sunset over an apple orchard or watching the kids play. You know, all those things. Like I'm, I'm savoring all of that in the moment so that on those days when he's not my best friend, <laughs> you know, I can, I can come back to that. And so it's easy to become very insular. And so putting. Jamel first is an act. It's that labor that you speak of um, and making sure that I'm actively loving him or making sure that I am a loving person or I'm thinking about him throughout the day. Challenges that we have in relation, a lot of challenges we have inside of relationships, sometimes it's not necessarily, most times, it's not necessarily directed at the person that's what it, that's in front of you. It's more a pattern um, that you've kind of developed over your lifetime, right? And different, what about there say different, different spaces, different people, but the same emotion, the same feeling. You have to keep constantly communicating about everything. Um, about things that are bothering you, about things that are bringing you joy in your life, about uh, things that you want to do, things that places that you want to go, uh, careers, kids, family dynamics, all of that stuff. You, you always have to to constantly talk about these things. Um, but if you're constantly communicating, you can identify those things earlier, and you can either um, you can either work try to work with it, work around it, or be more involved in it so that it's not somebody so much moving away or going in a different direction as the family is moving in a different direction that it, it, it kind of course corrects itself on you you've got we've got nieces and nephews we've got i mean our kids we have people that we work volunteers like there's so many people watching us and seeing our development and seeing our successes 
And then you've got those people who want so badly for you to fail. <laughs> and I was telling someone the other day, um, the idea of um, you can't have your, um, you can't expect your expectations of, of somebody, you know, your predicted expectations, like you're predicting how things are going to be and how they're going to be. You can't look at that in terms of like, it was an official contract we signed. A lot of people don't realize when they go into marriage, like it's teamwork. Like you're on a team, you're on a professional team. Like <laughs> you got positions, everybody's going to work together. Right. To, you got you gotta know each other's, you got to learn each other's strengths and weaknesses. I think the current state of the Smiths betrays, especially for those of you too young to remember, just how they were seen as a couple for most of my life. Since the 90s, the Smiths were the image of black love, an image that upon retrospect seems to very much have been not all that genuine, but maintained for the purposes of branding to sell us a status and look that evokes that white capitalist patriarchal framework of how we should love each other, just with a black face on it. For years, if there was a social media post or a magazine spread about black love, they were on the front page of it. But at the same time, that whole time there were rumors about them being swingers or having an open marriage or how they were about to get divorced. And then in 2020, we got not a confirmation of these rumors, but at least an indication that the nature of their relationship was not as idyllic as we had been led to believe. Folks are still trying to wrap their minds around Jada's revelation that she had a relationship or quote, entanglement with R&B singer August Alsina while she and Will were secretly separated. I've lost money, friendships, relationships behind it. And um, I think it's, it's because people don't necessarily know the truth, but I've never done anything wrong. Jada admitted to having an entanglement with singer August Alsina, although stating that it was when she and Will were not together. And Will has explicitly alluded to, and it's hard to confirm that he's had his own extramarital relationships as well. And there's also stories where Jada has explicitly talked about her feeling like she didn't want to ever be married in the traditional sense. And it doesn't take a lot to glean from these conversations that it was Will that was the driving force behind their image as black love goals and kind of forcing them into this traditional marriage box for most of the last 25 years. T Noir has a great video engaging with some of the politics of this story and how Will and Jada definitely had a cynical practice of selling an image of their family and relationship that probably wasn't real, but was definitely lucrative. And there are some concerning elements of grooming and problematic power dynamics between Jada Pinkett and her relationship with August Alsina. I'm beginning to wonder if we're overlooking a really useful lesson in what this fallout has presented to us. Bad marriage for life. <laughs> okay, wait, just hear me out for a second. On so many levels, we're clowning the Smiths for what really amounts to oversharing for bringing us into their Malcolm and Marie aftermath in real life, for disappointing our own false image of them that they definitely did help build because we wanted to buy into black love. But if you put away your judgment for a second and you disabuse yourself of the nonsense that we keep hearing from many of these gurus and their followers, what you're seeing here is the raw reality of what it means to partner with a human long term to commit yourself to the labor of maintaining an intimate and conditional relationship with the person. For the most part, we often hear people talk about unconditional love, and it's even a phrase I've used a lot of times. But as I progress in my own marriage, I realize that this isn't, to me, the best way to look at what real love and a partnership kind of needs to work as. Long-term partnership only works on the agreed condition that you stay committed to staying in that partnership. And that may mean changing the nature of what that partnership looks like. If you ask me, love is in the conditional agreement because you have to love a person truly to love them in all the different ways in which they might exist over a long enough timeline. If your goal for whatever reason is to partner long-term, to continue to work with a partner who has changed and to work through conflict that comes up in that relationship, I think Will and Jada have something to offer. They seem to be in a constant state of rededication to each other in whatever way that manifests for them. And witnessing that is more valuable than any Jet magazine cover they've had for the last 25 years. Cause like, here's the craziest thing about this moment that we've all memed to death 
myself included. After this all happened, Will and Jada had already worked this out. I don't know how it worked out. They had already seen the rumors and blogs and just let it slide. This was not new to them. And behind the scenes for them, it was done. And it was definitely Jada Pinkett's fault that they were in this predicament. And nobody would have blamed Will for letting Jada address this on her own. This image of Will's sad, tired face, though very memeable, is profound. A lot of men are angry at Jada for tarnishing our image of Will and seemingly unfairly putting him through so much grief for putting a good man in this situation. And a lot of that is valid, but I appreciate this moment on retrospect because black men never get to sit in this seat publicly. The dirt we dig through dealing with some of y'all and the recovery we have to submit to in the name of love happens all the time, but we don't have an image to attach ourselves to because to allow that to become public, ironically, it makes us seem like lesser men. Even though behind closed doors, we all know that there are a lot of men out there dealing with just as much conflict with their partners as there are women. So just as we should not be judging black women in the public eye who have had to hold L's from problematic partners, I'm not going to judge anyone anymore because on some level, Will's face, this face right here, this is black love. Many of these couples we've heard from today, my relationship included, have dealt with a lot to maintain their partnership. Financial challenges, infidelity, infertility, health crisis, blended families, etc. These are not bugs of long-term partnerships. They are features. And from what I could gather from them, myself included, the journey has been well worth it. The research shows that strong, intimate partnerships can have a significant benefit to people's quality of life. And it's pretty clear from any comment section from these dating guru videos that their advice will make you miserable and keep you single. Unless, of course, you buy their services. Funny that. I tend not to give advice or prescription in my videos, but I really can't emphasize enough that we need to remove this framework of white supremacist patriarchy as the guiding image of how we're supposed to love and partner with each other, because it just doesn't offer enough for how complex it is to love as a black person, especially if you're loving another black person. It is a recipe for failure. Now, this obviously doesn't mean there's one solution to the complex challenges that face black men and women. I do not endorse struggle love or abusive love or toxic love. But I also don't believe that any type of love exists that is not a struggle. What I'm saying is that we should be avoiding the frameworks of partnering that don't serve us individually and be careful in assuming that any particular framework serves you just because it has a strong social media presence. I'm not going to go as far as to say to stop engaging with your preferred black dating guru if it truly serves you to consume that. Just consider that at the end of the day, if they're selling you on this white supremacist framework, it won't work. And I pray you find something that does. And lastly, consider abstaining. Like for real, there are so many ways to manifest fulfilling lives and relationships that don't hinge on partnering in the traditional sense. When you hear how hard it is to be in a relationship and wonder why anyone would do that on purpose, when you hear the Lemonade album, when you see Will Smith's face, Maybe don't bother with it, real talk, and don't let people judge you for doing your own thing as long as it serves you. That's yet another trick of the devil, that you can't be fulfilled if you don't find someone to share that fulfillment with. It is my personal belief that when you focus on personal development and pursuing passions and self-improvement, that that's one of the best ways to align yourself with potential partners who will be value as, as opposed to drains on your energy. That's all I got right now. I'm gonna let the couples talk it out for a while before we go. She passed. So I saw these really, really strong women. So I came here saying, you're an accessory, not necessarily a necessity. And so Jamel helped me understand, okay, you saw all this and you saw these women be extremely successful, but you say you want a marriage and a marriage is a partnership. So we learned how to check each other and our egos at the door in terms of- I'm still working on trying to check you. That's true. Keep it's on. probably gonna be a while. Uh, but we learned how to work together about being in a partnership. 
there's this like magical idea that like when you fall in love, like you everything changes. Um, and you feel differently about, you know, in historically, like the traditional, like mononormative and patriarchal ideas that when a man falls in love, um, all of the other people disappear from your purview and you don't want, like you become some new person all of a sudden. And I think some time ago, I stopped worrying about what love was supposed to be mm. or supposed to feel like. Um, and just like, do I like what I'm feeling? Do, mm -hmm. right? Do I want to keep feeling? We teeter the line of if we step out of line of what people feel how a marriage is supposed to look, you get judged for it. And you know, if, if your views are different, you get judged for it. So I think it's a constant battle of doing everything that you feel and how you feel what works for your marriage and your relationship versus how society will look at you because they do place a lot of pressure on what's visible and and to be clear that's our goal to be very visible to show um another form of black love to show that it's not just a one size fits all but it's also a lot of pressure when you have so many eyes that are just like well this is how marriage is supposed to be between a man and a woman but also if you're gay this is how you should handle your marriage. Like I, he is my best friend. So I have someone there that is in my corner to support me uh, in whatever I do. Somebody tell me when I'm wrong, uh, not to be just like a yes woman, man, rather um, he gonna check me when I need to be checked and vice versa. Um, worst thing is he hogs the covers. Like I don't, help me to make the decision um and really be serious about you know am i going to be with him you know actually bring it to prayer i'm not just saying that because i came from church and really uh want the whole relationship to prayer because previously i, I could have been a person that said black love was trash until i kind of like met him i always talk about you know people like to say you know oh you know my husband he's ride or die or my wife is ride or die and i'm like no, I, I'll give you a clear example of ride or die because she left, you know, corporate America. She was on that fast track and she left corporate America to come back so I can finish my PhD. And at that time, it was me, her and our daughter. And we were living off of my graduate stipend, very modest graduate stipend. Right. And so it had gotten to the point where um, the Little Caesars, where we were eating Little Caesars three, four times, you know, a week which is just, I don't know how healthy, I don't know why we're alive still at this point. <laughs> just this year, we were talking about toddlers being wild, that they're feral. You know what I mean? Like just wild. He was such a gentle and tender and loving little yeah. itty bitty baby. And then two happened and it just, we watched him turn into a full human being with his own thoughts and ideas and yeah. language yeah. and id, full id. And it's just like, you want to jump off that? I, it's, it, and now I'm anxious all the time. Like, it's just... <laughs> I think it's what I said. Oh, and Lord. he swears up and down that I threatened the waitress. I don't think I did. But no, you did. The, you did. The waitress wouldn't talk to me. Oh, she did. kept making googly eyes at him. And I was like, excuse me, but I would... I don't remember threatening her. And then my, my toxic ass is like, yo, this is the... Oh, she threatened the waitress. This might be the one. <laughs> my um, and that's something that our when we took marriage counseling, they told us that what we have is genuine and that, you know, and so we were OK because we knew where we stood. We were OK because we understood each other. We were always going to get to know. And even if you get married, the person that you are when you got married and the person you are 15 years later is not the same person. The interests you have are different. The mm -hmm. things you like, what excites you. Um, all that stuff is different. So you constantly have to rediscover and um, learn about the person that you're with. So like before we had kids, there were things that you offered that I've like held in high regard. And then when you we became parents, it was like, oh wait, no, no, no. These things are the most important things. Those things are not as important, right? So mm -hmm. I had to readjust. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I think you know, the why is it's hard to answer because it changes, but I'll say that the most valuable thing
that we have going for us is that friendship I talked about. Is having been together so long and knowing each other so intimately. Um, and still finding good and beauty and 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 all kinds of stuff in each other it makes me kind of emotional. I think that is why we're still together. Oh, don't cut that out. I don't cry, I'm a bitch. <laughs> <laughs>